morning, OBC. Uh, my name is Mark Tully. Uh, my wife is Kelsey Tully. Uh, Riley Richards is my son. Uh, Victoria, Abigail, Emma, and Amelia are my daughters. Uh, we've been attending OBC for about six or seven years now. Uh, for myself, it's my first uh, church that I've attended, and I've met a lot of um, close people in my life at OBC. A lot of people that I would consider calling even family. For myself, I, I grew up in Ontario. I was in the middle of nowhere. Uh, and later on after high school, I joined the military. Uh, and Warmukto was my first posting here. And I've been here for about 13 years now. I absolutely love it. I consider this my home. Uh, and I would consider myself very lucky if I don't get posted and I get to finish my career uh, here in Warmukto. While attending OBC, there have been a few people who I would say played a significant role in my faith journey. It was very, very new for me. It was nice having people like Nigel Butterfield where you could sit and talk for hours about the Bible and what it meant and to kind of gain a bit of an, a perspective of what was different between my life and his life where he grew up in the church and I didn't. Um, so we've had a lot of interesting talks about that. Pastor Perry always randomly meeting with me for, you know, random prayer requests um, and just talking and catching up. My coffee time with uh, Devin, uh, usually Sunday mornings, just an opportunity with him to connect and get to know someone and have a good friend uh, who believes in the same thing that I do. Um, that's really meant a lot to me um, and it's given me a good example to follow. Some people at OBC that I think would be surprised uh, to know that they've had an impact on me. One would be Doug McLean. He's always willing to lead and to serve. Um, and I think that that's a good example uh, to follow. And I, I, I look up to that example that he gives us. Another one would be Matt Hogan. When I first started attending OBC, we had a lot of small groups going on. And, participated in a small group that was led by Matt Hogan and I remember just being very inspired that someone so young could lead other Christians and be so knowledgeable um, and easygoing at the same time so for me Matt made it very easy to find a place at OBC and uh, and honestly I look up to his ability to lead other Christians and to step up and do what needs to be done. Amen. Am I on? Well, that's up to the congregation to determine, isn't it? <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Mark. Um, appreciate your words. We've had testimonies over the past few weeks from folks, and uh, there's uh, still a few more to come. I hope you're getting a sense of all the different backgrounds uh, that we are here, and hopefully as we're able to move back into a... Um, to reassemble, uh, that gives you an opportunity to get together and have a coffee and, and get to know the great family that we have here. Uh, at OBC and the growing family that we have because there's always someone new coming and that's wonderful. We, we love that here. Um, as was mentioned earlier, thank you Devin for praying for Burma and um, for the situation that's going on there. My wife let me know that I said about the war in Afghanistan. It's actually the war in Ukraine. I think you guys all know that. Um, but uh, also that this month uh, we are doing a catch-up offering for missions. Uh, so uh, thank you for all those that are donating to the church. Thank you for those online that are donating as well uh, as we seek to fulfill God's ministry, not just in our community, but uh, to the ends of the earth. Uh, this week we, we heard about David Small in Burma. Next week we hope to have some information about the Crawfords in Senegal. And then on the 27th we're going to have a little meet and greet with our new um, missionary that's going to be going down to Guatemala through Canadian Baptist Ministries, that would be uh, Catherine. So that's, uh, that's, that will be coming up. So each of these next few weeks, we'll be talking about missions. And uh, if you want to just add an above and beyond to your offering, uh, help us get caught up on missions and maybe even bless them a little bit more, that would be great. And uh, just a huge thank you for that. 
Will you join with me in prayer? Let's pray. Father God, we are gathered here today, not by coincidence and not even by our own will that we, we pushed ourselves to get out in this, in this weather, to, to get up out of our comfortable beds. We are gathered here online and physically uh, to worship you, for you are worthy of being worshipped. This morning, as we look to your word, we're going to realize how great it is, the invitation that you've given to us, and how wonderful it is for what you have done for us. So, Lord, thank you that by your spirit you give us strength and you pull us forward. Thank you, Lord, that your spirit calls us and draws us to you even when we don't know you as our Lord and Savior. We thank you for your hedge of protection that's placed uh, over us and around us. And, and Lord, uh, the peace that can reside inside of us in the midst of, of strife and turmoil and, and uncertainty. Uh, Lord, we pray that through this rough patch that we've been through uh, as, as your people uh, in this world, Lord, we pray that it has drawn us deeper to you. And Lord, we ask today that you would draw us deeper into yourself, that you would uh, fan into flame the gifts that's been given to us, and, and that you would renew us in our minds and transform us in our living. Uh, Lord, may you speak through your word this morning to hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So um, this morning we're continuing on in our series. Um, over the past few weeks we've learned how a thief, a child, an aristocrat's wife, and uh, even an old Pharisee have been used uh, in accounts of, of Scripture to show us uh, more and more of God's nature. And we learn more about who we are called to be and who God is by seeing these um, regular folks, these, these folks that aren't really the Bible heroes, but we realize that they give us such impact when we, we read about them. This week, as has been the approach, and, and just, just pray for Devin every once in a while because he has to work with me. Uh, <laughs> Every week we get together, and, and on Tuesday I go, yes, I'm going to be preaching on this. And then by Thursday it's like, no, I'm preaching on this. So um, what was to be a sermon on Barnabas today uh, is now instead about the offensive believer. And this is a, a parable we're picking up um, on uh, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, and I'll be looking at verses 21 and 22. And here's what um, God's word tells us. Then uh, Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. Now, we're going to look at a little further ahead here, but I wanted just to start with this. This is the, the parable that Jesus is about to lay out stems from this conversation with Peter. Now, uh, Peter actually thought that he was suggesting an exceptional type of forgiveness. In the book of Amos, and the book of Job, it, it lays out a, a couple of times where an appropriate amount of forgiveness can be doled out to someone. Uh, and if you forgave someone up to three times, that was kind of the Jewish limit of forgiveness, right? So if someone offended you, you could forgive them. They offended you again, you forgive them one more time. And then finally, that last offense, you forgive them, but then that's it, right? Doesn't that sound, that sounds good, right? If, you know, three times, that sounds like a lot. Peter recognizes that Jesus is teaching and he sees Jesus' ministry and he sees his compassion. And he sees the healings that he does. And he hears about the great teaching of the Father and, and the understanding of, of how forgiveness is so tied to uh, the nature of God that Peter goes, you know what? 
How about seven times? That must be the new limit. Because for three times, that's like, you know, that's over double what, what, what the Jewish tradition is. Like, so God, you're a God of doing more than. So I, I would assume Jesus, good, good rabbi, good, good teacher, that seven times would be right, wouldn't it? And uh, not the first time that Jesus uh, doesn't agree with one of his disciples. <laughs> he instead came back and he said, no, actually, Jesus tied forgiveness to a lose count number. Jesus actually said 77 times. Some versions say 70 times 7. It's, a, it's an awkward wording of the, the, the numbers so that it could equally be referred to one or the other. But the, the gist of it is that Jesus is telling Peter that, now you're just, you're just scratching the surface when you're talking about forgiving somebody seven times. You may think that's extreme, but I actually say 70 times seven or 77 times, depending upon the version that you use. There is a reference to the 70 times 7 that's also found in Scripture before, way back in Scripture. Actually, in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 24, we see that uh, after Cain killed Abel, uh, that uh, he was banished uh, and to, because he was a danger. and He was banished to go away, but Cain was nervous that he would be uh, killed by anybody else that he encountered. And God placed a protection on him and says, if anyone harms Cain seven times, that amount will come against them. And then, well, what about Lamech, Cain's son? And the word of God says, well, 70 times seven or 77 times against Lamech. It's, it's interesting that God's protection over the sinful in Genesis 4.24 is the same reference that Jesus uses to tie to those that that are to seek forgiveness or to be forgiven in Matthew chapter 18. It's a lose count kind of number. Now, uh, we all know that cats have nine lives. Yeah, right. But, you know, we hear that expression, and, and uh, I don't know if your parents ever, if you ever heard this when you've misbehaved at home. One, Two, anybody ever hear that at home? What kind of dysfunctional household did I grow up in? <laughs> right? Don't make me say three. Right? So we're actually taught that there's a limit to forgiveness. That's what we're taught. We're taught there's a limit to forgiveness. And even if it's not expressed to us externally, we believe it internally. We believe that after doing something multiple times, now I am unforgivable. Because I wouldn't forgive somebody more than that myself. So how can I expect someone else to forgive me? By Jesus using a, a, this number, 77 or 70 times 7, that's a really hard one to keep track of. It really is. It, it's really going to be hard to go home and Mark off on the, on the list on the fridge. Okay, was that number 53 or 54 today that she said something that offended me? Like, it's meant to be a lose count number, like an infinite uncertain number. And it's also meant to be a number to remind us that this offense is not just to be forgiven. It's also to be forgiven and forgotten. I think sometimes when people forgive someone, what they do is they take the offense and they put it in a vault and they lock up the vault and they put it behind them. And they go, that's how I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to take this, what you've done, and I'm going to put it in the vault and I'm going to lock it up. Now, if we get into a heated argument or something, I'm just going to go back to the vault <laughs> and unlock it and pull up this weapon. See, you haven't truly forgiven if you're still able to pull it up in a future conversation, in a, fu in a future situation. That's not forgiving. That's just storing ammunition, right? 
God asks us to do more than store ammunition. He asks us to give it up. And he explains this out in this very powerful uh, parable. It's not Luke 8. It actually continues on. And it is in Matthew chapter 18. And picks up right after verse 22. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And he goes on for the, therefore. Therefore is that wonderful uh, linking word, isn't it? Because of this, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Say that one more time. 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. Do you really think he could pay back everything? Do you really think he could pay back ten? Like that many bags of gold? Anyway, that's what he says. Be patient with me, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. Heard that phrase before? Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, and they went and they told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Every once in a while, and, uh, we see a scripture that says, um, it says that in the end days, people will, will preach and it will tickle the ears. Well, you're not getting your ears tickled this morning, folks. Sorry. <laughs> But you're getting the word of God being proclaimed. And it's a good word. That's what I want you to see. I think it's, it's a really good word. Because here, I, here's what I want you to follow in this, in this parable. First of all, I want you to see the characters. There are three characters in this parable. You've just heard it. You can keep reading through it if you want while I'm talking. Maybe that will speak to you more even the sermon. If you want to keep reading through that parable over and over again. Not a bad practice to do. But in that parable, there are three primary characters. There is a king. There is a servant who owes the king, but is also owed by the third offender, which is uh, the, low, uh, the lowest of the, of the three um, in power. There is a king, a king that has authority over anything and everything. That's the king. His word goes. He owes nobody anything because he is the king. So that is your first character in scripture. It is really clear that Jesus is referring to um, God as the king. And if you're wondering, how do I get that? Well, verse 23 Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king. You got this? So he's tying God to the king. So for, he's, he's building this parable, first and foremost, on the nature of the king. And there is a king, and as he looks out, 
he sees the indebtedness of the people under him. And he starts with the one that owes him a whole lot. Right? I want you to see the offenses here. Uh, in another translation, it doesn't say bags of gold. It actually says 10,000 talents versus 100 denarii. So um, this man uh, that is under the king, that the king's looking through his, his paperwork. I used to be an accountant. And you go through and you're looking to settle your debts. You go to the highest ones first. That's what you naturally do. You don't go to the guy that still owes uh, his um, bread on his uh, accounts uh, receivable or accounts payable. You actually go to the, the biggest debtor you have and you start there first, especially if you want to get the most money in, right? So that's what the king does. He goes to the first debtor and he sees this guy owes 10,000 talents. Now, I just want to show you what that would be in a rough equivalent of money today. Seven billion dollars. That's the rough equivalent today of what that would be. Just mind-boggling, right? First of all, how you could rack up a debt of seven billion dollars, but that is the, um, the translation today. There is a king that has a servant that owes seven billion, can't even say that word, seven billion dollars. He is in huge debt. He is beyond insolvency, right? He is like, that is, oh, somebody seven billion dollars, right? I know there's a lot of us that are a little bit nervous about your mortgage. Like, this is seven billion dollars. And this debtor of this huge debt comes before the king and he asks and seeks for mercy. And the king cancels his debt. This is not debt rego re um, renegotiation. This is not a stay on payments. This isn't even a just, we'll just pay the principal back. This is, your debt is canceled. If any of you have ever been in financial difficulty, and I know far more people have than anyone would ever admit, if, some, if you've ever been in financial difficulty and somebody has come and said, I am going to clear your debts completely. Unless you've really been in a place of that, you don't know what that feeling is like. But to have it completely wiped out, that is what the king does for this first offender, this, this man that owes so much money. And the parallel is drawn between the king and a Christian, a follower of Christ, a God follower. Right? What has God forgiven us? Do we realize how great the debt that we have is that God has canceled? I think sometimes we go, oh, you know, oh, it's nice. God offers us a gift. We don't realize the depth of that gift of God to us, of the canceling of all our debts, right? Some of us hold on to some of our debts from the past. Some of us think God hasn't forgiven us of this, that, the other thing that we've done or we've thought. He has forgiven us of everything. When we ask him, when we turn to him, when we repent to him, he cancels all our debt. We don't owe him anything. Right? Like, debt-wise, it has all been paid by Christ. We walk into the mercy of it. Isn't that amazing? But then we get to the other part. This amazingly forgiven, once in a century type of event that's happened, where all the debts were wiped out of this man, 
How should this man then respond to others that have offended him? Well, we see what happens. He sees a guy that, off, uh, that owes him a hundred denarii. I, th I think um, an another version says silver coins. Or the modern equivalent is $12,000. $12,000 isn't much. If you have a New International Version Bible, it actually says in the study notes, just a few dollars. Well, it's, it's more than just a few dollars. It's actually, in today's rate, it would be closer to $12,000. That's, you know, minimum wage, that's probably about half a year's wages. So, you know, it's a, it's a considerable debt. The biggest thing, though, is that a $12,000 debt is huge, but not compared to what? A $7 billion debt. It's not huge when you compare it to what has already been forgiven. This is the key that Jesus is trying to teach about the kingdom of God through this parable. It's all relative. Here's what Here's what it boils down to. Here's how relative it is, right? What you have been forgiven, anything else that's an offender is nothing compared to what you have been forgiven, right? Even though it seems like, oh, that's quite a bit. It's nothing compared to what you have been forgiven. And then it leads to this, um, it leads the story on to the consequences, because when the parable breaks down at the end, once the master finds out how unmerciful, how unforgiving the forgiven man was, he's furious. You see, we need to be more aware of the title you carry than by making someone pay. Let me, I'll use it this way. We sometimes frame things as it's their fault, and they made me, and I'm angry at them because they, blah, 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 blah. When Jesus looks at every single one of us individually, he has one filter as he looks upon us. Okay, first of all, they are forgiven through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ of all their debts. And then he looks at them and he has this one question. Were they forgiving too? Or is their title an unforgiving person? If you are an unforgiving person, you're in dangerous territory. After you have been forgiven so much, how dare you not forgive? Your desire to make someone else pay just is not reflective of being a child of God. It's more reflective of being a child of the enemy. Do not live by the old way where $12,000 consumes you. Be consumed by the seven billion that you've been forgiven. Live as forgiven. And a forgiven person forgives. A forgiven person that gets what they're forgiven will forgive. We have a lot of folks that hold a lot of unforgiveness in their heart, probably, primarily, because they don't believe, first and foremost, that they have been forgiven, that they have not received the fullness or the understanding of the, the great forgiveness that they have in Christ. I encourage you to not be an unforgiving person, but I want you to know that you can't just get up and decide, okay, I'm just going to start forgiving. No problem. You need to have an understanding and experience of the fullness of the forgiveness that you've been given in order for you to forgive. You need God to transform you and recognize how great your salvation is in order so that you can then be uh, an instrument of that in your other relationships. If you try and do that without understanding who you are in Christ, that's kind of like trying to love someone else before you realize the love of God. It's going to be twisted, it's going to be perverted, and it's not going to last. 
But once you understand what God has given you, then you are a vessel of that to others. And here's the, here's the hard part. Verse 35 says this, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister. He doesn't stop there. He goes on and makes it even more uncomfortable. Does anybody have that verse in front of them? To, unless you forgive your brother or sister, what does it say? From your heart. Stink. That doesn't just mean I can say, I forgive you and walk away. Oh, it means a heart, like I'm going to let go of that. I'm not going to feel like you need to pay me or I'm going to hold you captive. But I forgive you from my heart, from the depths of me. That is a God thing. That is where we need the forgiveness of God to help us to forgive others. And not just one time or two times or three times. The most transformative people in God's kingdom are Christians who can forgive and are known as being forgiving people. But what if we're taken advantage of? But what if people know that and they, and they play me for a fool? Tell you what, once they hit the limit of God's forgiveness for you, then, then we'll have a chat. But God's forgiveness is like 70 times 7, that immeasurable, uncountable number, that 7 billion if you experience that and ask God to receive that forgiveness, maybe you held back stuff from God and you need to know that as you give it to him, he receives you and he says, just as it says in the scripture here, take, he will take pity on you and cancel the debt and let you go. Verse 27, that's what God so desires for you. For you just to come to him, and he will gladly cancel your debt, no matter how big it is. Let's go of it, and let you go in freedom. And, by the way, the um, debtors here, they're unnamed. <laughs> we don't know their names. They teach us a little about God, don't they? I pray, I pray, I pray that you begin to wrestle with how great your forgiveness is and how great your salvation is with Christ. That first and foremost. And then you will naturally live out that spirit in you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you that we are forgiven. If we spend every second of every day just saying thank you, we would not even have enough time in our lives to appreciate what you've given. You tell us in your word that your blessings are like the, the sands of the sea. Your forgiveness is immeasurable. God, we pray that maybe we will see the indicator in our lives of our battle with unforgiveness as a stepping stone to walk deeper into your forgiveness so that we may forgive others from our heart, a heart that has been transformed by you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.